Welcome to the Good Growing Podcast. I am Chris Enroth, horticulture educator with University of Illinois Extension, coming at you from Macomb, Illinois, and we have got quite a show for you today. We have got an odds and end episode. We are going to be chatting about pollinators, some disease issues, some late season insect issues, and much more beyond that. And I cannot do this by myself. I am joined, as always, by our, our co-host here, horticulture educator Ken Johnson in Jacksonville. Hey, Ken. Hello, Chris. Welcome back. It's good to be back. I will say that much. Yes. So, Ken, we are late in the season. We are, let's see, what is it, August 24th? Um, first of all, I have to say, I start out every summer thinking I'm going to get my fall crops seeded by August 1st or that first week. Still haven't. The month's almost over. I am on schedule, as usual, to get everything going by the 1st of September. How are you doing this year? Uh, we planted our lettuce and carrots for the fall um, Sunday. Mm-hmm. So it was at the 22nd. So we're not too far ahead of you there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you feel a little better. Um, but yeah, so I, I hopefully I, I will get these things going because every single year I say it's going to get done by 1st of August. Oh, still doesn't happen. So but anyway, Ken, you put out an excellent video, something that I have, have definitely been able to do in the past. And it, 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 I think it's easier to remember to do this. It's, it's the ideal time for it, but dividing iris. And so can you talk a little bit ab- about that? What type of virus specifically were you show, showcasing in the video? And why do we do this late in the summer? So I was doing uh, bearded iris. Um, so we got some iris uh, when we moved my grandparents out of their house took some of the iris from there, planted them. It's probably been, well, a lot longer than it should have been because I had some pretty <laughs> massive clumps that were really hard to get apart. Um, but yeah, we do usually do that July, August. Um, that gives those new rhizomes that are forming kind of enough time to, to fully form more or less, put on a good root system. Um, and it's still early enough that those plants can get pretty well established before winter sets and they get some good root growth on there. Um, it's may not be the most fun time in the year to be dividing plants, but it is a good time. And they like little drier soils um, and stuff too. So it's not too big of a deal for them to do it now. Yeah. Yeah. I I'd say this is ideal. And the thing that I love doing is when you, when you divide them, you cut them, the foliage, the sword like foliage into fans. And so you can fan yourself with the foliage, but you got to plant it again. Um, But your, your video really goes into a lot of detail. I would, I would argue, listeners and watchers, this is everything you need to know to divide your iris and do it successfully. Uh, yeah, Ken, I didn't even realize that you know where you see the flower stalk coming up, you need to get rid of that because that is not going to be blooming again. That one's done, so toss it. Another one, you know, it's kind of hard to show on video, but those soft ones when you're dividing, those, especially if you're doing it by hand and you stick your thumb in there when you're doing it. <laughs> it's not a gross link and it smells disgusting it's usually bacterial soft rot so any kind of bacterial rot um those smell pretty bad so like a bad potato keep, yes very much it's kind of like changing a, a baby's diaper and <laughs> oh no <laughs> so yeah so keep that in mind when you're doing that um maybe you want to check a little more closely than i did sometimes when you're grabbing them and and breaking them apart yeah and and you show how to how to replant them and everything. And I remember at Missouri Botanical Garden, we divided their iris collection one year and we they're pretty much planted in sand. And when we replanted them, we almost just like set them on top of the ground and just put like a shovel full of like sandy soil on top of it. You know, we don't, you don't have to like bury them too deep because then you get those rot problems that you described. Yeah, you usually want to make sure you can still see that rhizome, at least part of it um, sticking up above. So that's another thing we did this weekend. Um, a lot of people, will, when they divide them, they do it right away. Um, it's okay to wait for a little bit. You don't want to wait weeks and weeks. Um, some people will wait until they kind of, that area that you've broken off is kind of scabbed over. Um, I mean, you can hold on to them for maybe a week or two before yeah. planting them. Definitely. Well, folks, we will put a link to that video uh, in the show description below because uh, it is excellent. It is definitely something that um, is useful if your iris are not blooming like they used to. Check this video out. Go out, get them divided. And if I can do it, anybody can do it. 
Yes, if this if Ken can do it, we all can do it. We we come on, we can believe in ourselves. We can divide our Irish, we get our fall vegetables started, we can we can get this done. Um, it's only August 24th, after all. Um, Ken, something fun, exciting that you, I, and several other extension colleagues are going to be doing next week, though, is we are going to be in Decatur, Illinois at the Farm Progress Show. Um, tell us a bit. So we are on the horticulture team with U of I Extension. What are we doing there? What Do we have any displays going on? We, we do. You know more about this than I do since you just named it. <laughs> yeah, that's my best. Uh, maybe. But, yes, we will have some um, some displays of some of the kind of the native plant gardens um, that have been designed or set up. Um, high pollinate garden. Uh, we're doing some stuff from the Illinois Indiana Sea Grant, right? Yep. Setting up one of theirs, um, as well as the pollinator pocket. So kind of mm -hmm. displays of what those could look like if you decide to plant some of those in your yard. Um, kind of give you an idea of, of what you're getting yourself into, what they'll look like potentially. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I was in, in the planning meeting and I don't know if you were there for that meeting, Ken, you were there for future meetings, but I said, Ken wants a pollinator theme. And so I'm like, we have to do a pollinator <laughs> theme. So that's what we went with because I knew that's what you would want. That's what we ran with. Exactly. Yeah, that's right. Um, and so I think as, so as you mentioned, um, I have had a, a heavy hand in doing some layout and plant selection. One huge issue this late in the season are finding blooming plants right now. That's not a very common thing to find late season plants in bloom in a nursery. So uh, let's talk a little bit about some of these late blooming uh, plants and some of the other plants that will also be displaying. I mean, things like little blue stem, prey drop seed, uh, even though they might not be necessarily blooming right now, they still are, I, would, I call them like supporting characters in a pollinator garden. You know, they're, they do, they do, they could offer some pollen resources, but really they're also there for, for other needs, supporting other taller forbs or wildflowers. Um, but then also can, a, a lot of ground nesting bees, you can find them under those fibrous rooted grasses, right? Is that a common place? Yeah, I've, I've heard of like bumblebees um, will occasionally set up nests near the base of those plants. Um, and yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if you had, because if, especially if some of that ground around them is cleared, um, you probably find some, potentially some ground nesting bees uh, in there as well. Yeah. And I think yeah. the other thing with those, you know, they, they may not be, you know, they don't have these real big, nice flowers, but you know, your um, little blue stem and stuff in the fall will, a lot of times will change to more of a reddish color. So they can still add some, some color to your landscape as well. Prey drop seed will get kind of a yellowish color um, as well. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. And so there, there's a lot of different components within these plants. So you mentioned the iPollinate garden. We can start there. Um, so I pollinate, and, and you might know more about this program than I do, Ken. Uh, Kelly Alsip, our colleague, she's, she's worked pretty closely with this citizen science research where they are examining common landscape plants, mostly annuals for the most part, um, and seeing do they contribute at all to pollinator as a pollinator food source. So things like lantana, um, petunia, uh, uh, Gerber daisies, very, very common annual bedding plants. And so um, it's, they, they give you a plant list and you go out and you monitor these like a few times a year to see how many pollinator visits they get during the time that you're monitoring them. Uh, so we are gonna have an example, I pollinate garden there. And I know um, we're gonna have some different types of marigolds. Um, let's see, we're gonna do a couple different herbs uh, and things like that that are also listed on on their plant list. Anything else I might be missing? Do some of those have zinnias in it or? Yes, yes, zinnia. Zinnia is a pretty popular one. Actually, I see lots of painted ladies right now on zinnias um, and, and other late season butterflies and moths are seem to really enjoy zinnias. Yeah, I went home for lunch today and had a couple of monarchs. Um, on our zinnias and stuff and at this time last year we had a lot of <clears throat> monarchs and swallowtails um, on the zinnias we had planted mm -hmm. it, kind of as an aside i just uh, got a message from uh, one of our master gardener master naturalists and she gets communications from monarch watch and they're expecting a larger overwintering population this year in mexico for monarchs i guess it's been a, a good year 
barring any environmental disaster here <laughs> between now and when they get to Mexico. But we'll see. Hopefully the rain comes so there's some nectar plants for them to, to feed on a, on their way down. Yep. Yeah, our, our goldenrod, I think it's slowed down a little bit. It's getting, it's, it's pretty dry in our neck of the woods. So we, we need a little bit of moisture in the ground. Um, our, our other garden that we're working on is the uh, Indiana Illinois Sea Grant. They have several different brochures of different types of native plant gardens. Um, we are specifically utilizing their plant list for their pollinator garden for full sun plants. Um, so we're going to be, that's like where you're going to find the grasses. Um, we're going to have some, oh, what do we have? Yellow cone flower. Um, and we're going to, oh boy, I should have had these plant lists in front of me when I was <laughs> putting this together. I can find out real quick. Um, was it rattlesnake? Was that in there? Yes, that we're going to do rattlesnake master. Um, we have some phlox, paniculata, um, and some of these are named cultivars. In the nursery trade, it's hard to find sometimes a straight species. Um, I mentioned yellow coneflower. Um, and also, we're going to have some blue, purple coneflower, um, black eyed Susan, Menarda, which is bergamot. Um, let's see. Oh, we have a false sunflower. That I, I have so us and our colleague Jennifer Fishburne, we went and picked these plants out. The false sunflower, the cultivar name is Bleeding Hearts. That's in my backyard right now. Uh, it's going to be very hard for me to give that one up <laughs> to the show. I love that flower. It's beautiful. It's really neat. Um, Can't wait to see it. I, I haven't heard of that one before. So I yeah, look forward it's, to set up. <laughs> it's multicolored. It's really, really cool. Yeah. Um, ironweed. Ironweed right now uh, is one of my favorite flowering plants. And hopefully we got a couple bundles of ironweed. Those hopefully they, they were a tiny little buds on them for blooms. I hope they popped by next week when we're at the Farm Progress show. So, uh, and, and of course we have to include our milkweed. So we have a Sclepus tuberosa, which is, um, that's swamp milkweed. How do I know the is that butterfly? Name? Butterfly weed. That's butterfly weed. Okay. Sclepers tuberosa, which is the more ornamental. I call it the more ornamental, the orange flowered butterfly weed. Um, we're going to have swamp milkweed. Uh, I have some common milkweed that I will be bringing, which is um, loaded. It, it has several monarch caterpillars on it right now, actually. And then another really cool one is viburnum dentatum. And this cultivar name is Chicago Luster. Now, viburnum is a spring bloomer, but this is getting these bluish purple berries on it. It's gonna be really, really cool to have these in the gardens as well. Awesome. I look forward to seeing all this because a lot of these plants, you, know, you hear of them, but you don't necessarily see them a lot, so. Yeah. Yeah, that's a familiar conversation, you know, we're. We're handing out these, these programs for iPollinate, for the Sea Grant. Uh, the other one is Pollinator Pocket. And it's they have these plant lists and these uh, mocked up designs on them. But what do they look like? So this is our chance to see what they look like. And I hope I do you guys justice. <laughs> we'll see. I have faith in you. <laughs> I don't know. Um, when I was out last week for jury duty, it got. I, I asked my kids to water for me. I think they skipped the goldenrod a couple times. It was uh, fireworks, so a cultivated variety. Um, it, might rough. Make it. it might not make it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the others, they got water, but somehow they skipped over the goldenrod. <laughs> oh. So, uh, and, then, and then finally, our third theme garden for the Farm Progress Show is going to be pollinator pockets. Now, pollinator pockets, they do give a plant list. They even give like a little mock-up design that you could place plants in like an oval shaped bed, but they are not very uh, specific of their plant list. Basically they're like any pollinator plant and they include things like annuals, perennials, shrubs, uh, herbs. Uh, they, they even do small trees and things like that. So anything that's beneficial to pollinators. And so we had a little bit more leeway with that one. So I know we're gonna be showcasing some herbs and some annuals. Um, and we're going to do some allium, some, some ornamental onion on there. And those are also in my backyard. And they are every day loaded with everything from flies to bees, butterflies. They love that. 
And I think it's it's important to kind of point out that you know a lot of times we talk about pollinators, it's native plants, native plants, native plants, which obviously these our pollinators have evolved with, but some of our annual bedding plants can still provide those resources, nectar resources and pollen resources for these pollinators as well. So you don't have to go exclusively uh, native plants in order, in order to, to do some of this stuff. Yes, that, that is an excellent point. And I think that's why our plant lists include a lot of annual plants, herbs, vegetables, you know, you know, like our cucurbits, things like that benefit. And they, they not only benefit from having pollinators, but they can benefit pollinators. Um, so yeah, it, it should be a fun show. So folks, if you are in the, De the Decatur area, or if you'll be at the Farm Progress Show, check out the uh, University of Illinois Extension uh, tent. Uh, we will be there. Oh, what is it? It's August 31st through September 3rd or 4th. Um, basically a Tuesday through a Thursday. And yeah, we'll have some giveaways. We'll be giving away milkweed seed. Um, where we'll have, it'll be a fun time. So come on, come on down, learn about pollinators and all the other things that Extension does. That's just one part of it. So those are going to be, some of the animal people are going to be there. Mm -hmm. We'll have nutrition and wellness. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I think um, they're going to be doing some disease stuff. So you got microscopes and stuff. If I remember right. So yeah, yep. it will, it'll be more than just us if you're, even if you're not interested in horticulture. Yeah. If you're not interested in horticulture, I don't know why you're listening to us. But <laughs> why? Maybe they're just waiting for that that piece of knowledge that we're going to drop. It's like that's why I'm listening. You know how to uh, how to shoe a horse. You know, just waiting for that episode. <laughs> <laughs> just waiting um so yeah check us out uh we will be there uh it, it'll be a fun time ken and i will be there along with our colleagues so it should be fun have you ever been to farm progress before i have never been there i i, I don't know what to expect i don't know no, I've, I've never been there either so yeah I'm not sure what i'm getting myself into here yep yep uh and, and maybe i shouldn't be telling people to come there but i should i should you should, you should be there, folks. It, it'll be a fun time. Um, and it should be nice and hot, too, if, if weather trends stay the same. I think it's supposed to cool off a little bit on Tuesday, last okay. I saw. Granted, okay. that's <laughs> still a week away. but A week away. I mean, yeah, it'll cool off, but it'll still be 90% humidity or something. Like that. <laughs> <laughs> well, Ken, we do have a couple other items uh, to talk about today and a few questions that are pretty common here um, that tend to come into the extension office. And I know one question that you've gotten uh, recently, someone called in asking about their apple tree. And they were wondering, why are their apples so small? So is uh, they just uh, tiny apples? Uh, what, what's happening with their apple tree? So usually when you end up with small apples on your apple trees, it's because you didn't do any thinning. Um, so basically the, the tree has kind of so much, only so much energy they can spend on producing fruit um, and that can either go into a bunch of bunch of fruits in that case your apples are going to stay small uh, if you go through and thin your apples you're still going to have that same amount of energy but it's going into fewer apples so they're going to get bigger um, so a lot of times if you go through probably june sometime uh, go through thin apples usually leave a couple of apples per cluster maybe four to six inches between those clusters and stuff if you go through thin that out um, that'll help you get bigger size on your apples uh, and some apple cultivars can be prone to biennial bearing. So they'll bear real heavy one year and the next year you won't get much fruit, if any. Um, so by thinning it out, you can kind of prevent that biennial bearing and, and get production every year. And that's how the commercial folks do it too. I mean, they, they, they thin flowers, right? They thin apples, the fruit. I remember, I forget who it was. It was at an in-service and he took a, a wiffle ball bat, a plastic one, and just started whacking at the limbs of the tree. And he's like, that's how I get the flower. I think that's how he thins out the flowers or maybe the small fruits as they're developing. They, they yeah. knock off pretty easy. So with apples, a lot of times they'll use um, chemical thinners. Um, mm -hmm. And with peaches, there's no really, well, I think they may be, there may be one coming out next year in the next few years. Um, but traditionally, yeah, they use a, I've gone and <clears throat> done it just to kind of see what's done. Yeah, they have wiffle ball bats um broomsticks with padding on them and they'll just go and beat the, the peach trees 
uh, to thin them out. And, and, you know, I was doing it. I was like, Oh God, I'm knocking all these off. They're not going to have any peaches left. And the grower came by and was like, yeah, you're not even close to thinning. Oh, wow. So yeah, it's, you, you knock them off and then you think you're done. At least in my case, you knock some more off and mm -hmm. told me not to quit my day job. <laughs> but so yeah, so yeah, thinning is important yeah, for, for apples and peaches too, if you grow those, um, so you can get some good, good size on those, those fruit. And with homeowners, <clears throat> I, probably not going to be doing chemical thinning. You can thin your apples by hand. If you've only got, you know, handful of trees, it's, it shouldn't take you too terribly long. Yeah. I, we actually have a peach tree right outside our window here at the McDonough extension office. And once every seven years, we get a peach crop. I mean, it's not very reliable, but this year, and oddly enough, we had a late May frost, which is weird, but we have beautiful peaches this year. Absolutely glorious full of spotted wing drosophila, but that doesn't matter if you don't look very closely. A little um, extra protein for you. <laughs> there you go. Just a little extra protein. I, I brought some peaches home and I, had our, I just was picking them off the tree. We don't spray it with anything at all. Um, and I, I took a couple bites out of a few of them and uh, fed them to my children, uh, the rest of my family. And the next day, the remaining peaches that we didn't eat were swarming with spotted wing drosophila flies, fruit flies that were the larva maggots inside the fruit. So, but we're fine. We're still here. It's all good. It's all natural. That's right. All natural. Oh yeah. <laughs> all right. So switching topics from eating insects to uh, some, <laughs> some other questions. That's another show. <laughs> we, sh we should do one on that. We should. Before the cicadas come up. Like yes. cicada is going to be part two. Yes. In 2024. If we're still doing this. <laughs> <laughs> why wouldn't we be <laughs> <laughs> so another question that you've gotten chris um i haven't gotten too many over here um, but lilac leaves turning brown a lot earlier than they should be any ideas as to why that's happening up in your neck of the woods no real idea um but <laughs> and, and that's because um it, it, it probably is a few things happening um there are a few pests that do attack lilac. There's the, the lilac stem borer. Uh, I don't think this is the case this year, at least. Um, there's powdery mildew. Again, probably not the case, which is a pretty common leaf disease. One thing that really did happen this year is we had two weeks of like straight rain in, in the early month of June. Now lilac, like other many other plants, when the soil saturated, the roots can't breathe, that means they, they can die. You can get root loss. I think a lot of that happened, at least in my neck of the woods. And well, what happens as we get farther into the summer, it gets hotter, it gets drier. The plant doesn't have the root system to support the growth that flushed out that spring. So I think we're seeing a little bit of leaf scorch that's occurring from that. It's basically, it's kind of like a drought almost. Now, the reason why I, I, uh, I would speculate on the other diseases, I think that there is a fungal pathogen called Pseudocerospora leaf spot. And it's, it's a fungal disease, uh, very similar to Pseudomonas, which is a bacterial disease. Um, but to know that for sure, we would need to have a test or a sample sent to the U of I Extension Lab Plant Clinic to confirm that. I don't know that much. I, so I, I mean, I can suspect that's what it is, but I don't have a conclusive lab test saying this is what it is, but it is so widespread this year in my neck of the woods in Macomb. I'm getting a lot of questions from the Galesburg area as well. I'm guessing, like I said, I'm guessing it's a fungal leaf disease. That's what I think it is. Possibly it could be the bacterial disease, uh, but I think it is in combination with a couple other fac weather factors, including um, the, the saturated soils we had earlier in the season. And I wrote an article on this one uh, on the Good Growing blog. And so we will post a link to, to that. Ken, are we doing a good job cross-promoting our stuff? This, yes, this week? we are. <laughs> okay, good, good. <laughs> so yeah, check that out. If you have questions, it's got pictures and things of uh, the different types of diseases and, and afflictions of lilac. See, we're gonna keep cross-promoting. Mm -hmm. It's National Peach Month. And Katie wrote about that a couple weeks ago. Oh, that's right. Yes. And so 
I told you I fed my family maggoty peaches. Have you been eating peaches recently, Ken? Um, we went down to Calhoun County. Um, it's been several weeks ago and got some. I haven't had any recently, but yes, we have, we have gotten our peaches, some mm-hmm. peaches this summer. Okay. Uh, our, our local brewery, they collected uh, some peaches from, I don't know if it was Calhoun County, but it was a Southern County, well, South of McDonough County. And they did a local peach ale. And so that was delicious. Um, so, so many things you can do with peaches. Oh yeah. And we can link to Katie's article um, on that. And, and you've, you've posted that, you've shared that on social media, right, Ken? Uh, yes, on the Illinois Extension Horticulture Facebook group. We should probably link to that too. Yeah. There's so, so yeah. many links this week, <laughs> folks. This is going to be insane. If you haven't joined, join. That's right. You can join it, ask questions, or just watch as, as other people ask questions that you might have similar conundrums. So Ken, I, I recently got a question in uh, dealing with insects and vegetable crops. And since you're my insect guy, I'm going to ask you, is it, are we late enough in the season that we shouldn't be worrying about cucumber beetle um, or squash bug for that matter? Should we be trying to control these still or is it just too late? I think with, with cucumber beetle, kind of the big concern with them is bacterial wilt. And I'd say we're probably getting late enough in the year where that's not going to be too big of a concern anymore. We're kind of getting close to winding the season down um, with a lot of our cucurbits. Um, the issue with them and with squash bugs, if, if you have a big enough population, most start feeding on, if you're growing pumpkins, start feeding on those pumpkins. Um, that can start, you know, that, the beetles chewing on that can kind of scar that, that um, rind. Um, and then squash bugs, if you get enough on there, you can, I've had them where I just, I didn't care anymore. And we had a whole bunch on there and they got on some of the pumpkins and they just basically deflated them. Um, they just turned to mush because of all the feeding. So if you only have a few here and there, probably don't need to be too concerned about them. But if you've got some, some fairly healthy populations, you may want to still try to to do some management on those, get those numbers down so they're not getting onto your fruit, um, potentially damaging those because that's why we're growing pumpkins and stuff is to get those fruit. Mm-hmm. And that could be, and if, and if you've got a lot of adults, um, especially for squash bugs, the chemicals you can spray aren't really going to do much to them. Um, so maybe something like go put a board out at night. Uh, those bugs will congregate under there. You can go out early in the morning and um, dispose of them, smush them do whatever you want to um, get rid of them that way. Yeah. Um, when we've had squash bug problems, it was not last year. It wasn't 2020, it was 2019. And it was in our food donation garden. And so uh, we, we tried to avoid spraying as much as possible. And so I would do selectively spraying. I would do the board trick, uh, scraping them into a bucket of soapy water. And, and late enough in the season, I found that there is a parasitic fly that goes after squash bugs. And I would see squash bugs that had been parasitized and they kind of look a little deflated. Um, And so it was interesting. Now, again, it's not always something to rely upon, but late in the season, I was seeing biological control squash bug, which was awesome. I could stop spraying late in the season, but I don't know, Ken, is that that, um, something Am I even close to hitting the nail on the head here? <laughs> I hope I am. Because I, I looked it up and I'm like, this all looks like it's it's running together here. Like it should should be correct. See, I, I personally haven't seen it, but yeah, there's, there's some kind of parasitoid out there for everything. Any kind of pest we have, any kind of insects got something that wants to eat it. So yeah, it wouldn't surprise me if there, there'd be stuff moving in, um, especially late in the year as those squash bug populations start getting high. It's easier mm-hmm. to find them your parasitoids, you know, if they've been feeding early in the year, their populations are building up too. So yeah. another thing, if you, know, if you have squash bugs, you know, I, you still probably want to be looking for eggs and nymphs and stuff um, just to make sure that's not out there. We're getting a little later in the year, so it's probably not going to be quite as common, um, but there's still mm-hmm. that potential you could see uh, some of those out there. Yeah. I, and in terms of squash vine borer, our zucchini here in our food donation garden, there was a few that got affected this year. Uh, it, we just pulled those and then the master gardeners immediately just planted new zucchini starts in a different part of the garden. 
So there is going to be some late season zucchini also here. Uh, so that that's another way also to deal with some of these insects is kind of moving around the garden and, and stagger out your planting dates. Yeah, and with <clears throat> squash vine board, now those delts aren't flying anymore. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, so you wouldn't have to worry about those <clears throat> getting into your plants anymore either. Perfect. Perfect. Well, Ken, that was a lot of great information and a lot of good cross promotion and links that are going to be in the description below. <laughs> <laughs> you should, you do, we need to include the link to uh, subscribe to the weekly email too. That's right. Hey, did you know we send out a weekly email, listeners and viewers? Um, you can be on that weekly email. Um, and, and I know you're just, you, you're, you're hunting around for us every single week looking for, for us. So, hey, we can skip that whole step and we'll come directly to your inbox. So, hey, another link down below. Um, so, well, and the Good Growing Podcast is produced by Wendy Ferguson and it is edited by me, Chris Enroth. Ken, thank you for being here. And, and we sure do miss Katie, who is off uh, sightseeing with her family, I think, in the uh, good old, uh, what is it, the STL? Uh, I don't know the nickname for St. Louis. It's not the Big Apple. It's not the Big Easy. The Lou? It's something else. It's the what? Do they call it the, the Lou? The Lou, that's right. The Lou. Welcome to the Lou. <laughs> well, I'm from yep. the Chicago area. You and I know this. Well, I'm from between Chicago and St. Louis, <laughs> and I don't have to know any of that. So. <laughs> you just have to know, are you in Cardinals territory or Cubs territory? This and is I'm, in the, I'm in the middle. So, <laughs> um, well, folks, uh, Ken, thank you again for, for being here this week and chatting with us about pollinator gardens and everything else that comes across our desk uh, on a daily basis. Yes. And thank you. And let's do this again next week. Oh, we shall do this again next week. I mean, we'll be a farm progress show, but the week after, we're definitely going to have guests Eliana Brown and Lane Kenoki on the show. We're going to be talking about the Red Oak Rain Garden. We're going to talk about some of the publications that they put out about native plants, pollinators, uh, rain garden, stormwater, and green infrastructure. So that will be a fun show to check out. So listeners, thank you for doing what you do best, and that is listening, or if you're watching us on YouTube, watching, and as always, keep on growing. <laughs>